manager for uh, Infinity Blockchain Ventures. I'm so happy to be prior to this. I All work. right, hello everyone. How are you? Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, today we are going to have a very special uh, webinar by the title of a Blockchain and how it relates to higher education. Um, we have been carefully thinking about what is it that we what is it that we actually wanted to share with you guys because um, this topic has been going around and as students I'm sure it is going to be very informative for all of you guys. Uh, with this we would like to introduce our very special guest of the day. We have Ms Jazila Mohsen. she's the community and marketing manager for Infinity Blockchain Ventures Malaysia and Dream Berhad. And we also have Dr. Saad Muswah Najil Asil. He is the head of Student Central and senior lecturer at the Faculty of Medicine at Masa University. And I myself will be your host for today. My name is Tara Ahmed, and I'm the marketing lecturer at the Faculty of Business, Finance, and Information Technology at Masa University. Um, before we start, we would like to warmly greet our. Our guest for the day, Ms. Jazila, would you kindly like introduce yourself to us? Sure, definitely. Hi, my name is Jazila, and I'm the Community Marketing Manager for Infinity Blockchain Ventures. Uh, prior to joining the blockchain sphere, I was in telecommunication for about five years, so I'm happy to share everything I know that's going in Malaysia to the students, and hopefully we'll answer a few questions that we may have as well. Thank you so much. We're very glad to have you with us. And Dr. Saad, could you kindly introduce yourself to us? Of course. Hi, uh, my name is Dr. Saad. I'm the head of Student Central uh, and senior lecturer at the Faculty of Medicine, Bioscience and Nursing, Masai University. And I think this topic um, really, um, it, it is such an important topic, especially from the, the perspective of students. And this is why actually I, I'm really uh, glad for this opportunity. We're going to talk about all the aspects of blockchain particularly in the education sector and how it impacts our students' uh, life from the moment they register up until graduation. So yeah, uh, thanks for, for having us. Thank you so much. Now, Dr. Saad, we do understand that you have prepared us some slides and maybe you would like to share with all of us what is the meaning of blockchain and how do you see it relative to the education industry in today's world? Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Tara. Now, before I dive in into what is the definition of blockchain, let me just give you a background about uh, what we do here uh, at our university. Um, see, uh, as the head of Student Central, I mean, our unit was um, established about uh, two years ago, the, the Student Central unit, uh, for the, the, the aim of providing services to our students. When I say services, I mean everything from the registration of the students, the orientation programs, monitoring their attendance, their master classes, participating in different curricular and extracurricular. So you are talking about a huge amount of data here. Uh, the amount of data that being stored, uh, shared across many platforms is, is, is really big. And uh, of course, I mean, many universities, they are using different types of platforms and softwares, but uh, I believe, I strongly believe that the, the, the blockchain technology will definitely uh, make our lives, uh, especially in the education sector, a lot more easier and more robust. And this is why actually we have chosen this topic. So in a nutshell, we at Student Central, we really need, um, a revolutionary technology that will make our work a lot more easier, error-free, and this is where this technology comes. Now, to give you a perspective on what is blockchain, the, the simplest definition of the word, I mean, block in the literal uh, meaning is basically a data, a data set, and the chain itself is the, 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 the domain that is actually shared in it. Uh, probably uh, many people might not be familiar with the concept, but initially it started in the concept of Bitcoin or the cryptocurrency, but ever since then it has expanded to so many different uh, applications. 
So uh, this is the very simple definition of blockchain. It's basically a, a, a system that stores, shares, and verifies data, and it actually uh, makes it error-free, uh, and it's unable actually to, to fraudulate the data. This is the most important thing. Uh, how do we use it in the education sector? This is an important question. Uh, you're talking about um, students when they first register, for example, uh, they, they require uh, they require to provide their uh, database, you know, their particulars, the information. And most of these information are actually private. So uh, blockchain offers the solution that actually can help the university or the institute to ensure the privacy, the full privacy of, of, of these students' data while making it easy and accessible to share it among uh, you know, the, the different units or departments of the university. So uh, not only it actually can help track or store the students' particulars, but also helps to verify the attendance of the students, as well as uh, become part of their, uh, you know, student record. Uh, and uh, of course, as a university, the, the, the student records or archiving the students is such a is such a huge task. And back in the days, you know, universities they used to um, store or archive their students' data using you know the physical files. Of course, now everything is going uh, digitized. But even the digitization, um, it, it requires a lot of data, a lot of space, and you need a really robust system to ensure that the data is safely stored. And um, it is actually, um, you know, it's hack free, basically. And, and blockchain definitely provides the means for that. So I, I believe that it has a huge potential, particularly in the education sector, on so many different uh, aspects. So in simple words, Doctor, to my humble understanding, what you are trying to share with us is if you have a blockchain system, then nobody can actually forge any more certificates, attendances, so on and so forth. And you will also be able to access all the data that you need from anywhere around the world without any fuss. And if you want to get employed, then it will be much easier for you to go through the interview process because all your documents will be obtained by the company but this is of course so much further into the future now um, miss jazila uh, we would like to also know about your point of view or how is it that you understand or how is it you would like to explain to us what blockchain is sure definitely so actually what dr said was very point one on how the best case scenario for um blockchain is right so the screen right now is actually about Asia Blockchain Review. So if anybody wants to know more about the fundamentals of things and companies that are starting to implement blockchain technology, they can of course drop by um, their website. Uh, but that being said, I need to be realistic about it, right? Um, at the current point in this current stage, it really does involve a lot of fundamentals uh, being built especially in right now when we are still in the midst of being a very digital country. So imagine um, the start of the internet, for example, and it took so long for it to build. So the start for that is, of course, having more students, uh, more companies adopting it. Uh, definitely, it has potential to go in that area. And I will share later on about the real case studies that's going through in Malaysia and also in Vietnam. All right, then if this is the case, so now we are very able to determine or maybe at least we will be able to, because as students, maybe you will not go and venture into blockchain. But I always do tell my students that as a business student, for example, or any type of student, you should be able to answer when somebody brings up a topic, especially a hot topic like blockchain, right? So Dr. Saad, we were wondering, um, what actually uh, is the development timeline for blockchain? When did it start? How did it happen? Well, yeah, uh, to be honest, uh, me personally, uh, I had, you know, not so much of, 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 of that exposure to blockchain. Um, but, you know, uh, you, you can't deny the, its impact, especially recently. 
So, you know, you start to, to search for it, you start to learn a bit. And yeah, to my surprise, actually, the technology, I mean, was established uh, all the way back to 1998. And, uh, but uh, it, it was somehow, it, it started to take shape in 2008 uh, by, uh, I mean, that, that was basically the start of the, the, the first blockchain. And the origin of it was in 2009 by uh, Satoshi and Nakamoto, which basically released the Bitcoin white paper. That was the, the spark that started it all. Uh, and in 2012, as you all can see, the transaction, the first Bitcoin transaction started and that basically revolutionized, uh, I mean, the, uh, the, the financial sector. And uh, with time, by 2015, uh, the, the, the block, the, the Genesis block was created and all the way in 2018, the applications, the mobile app uh, or the applications basically of it was started. So I think in the education sector, probably, um, uh, what concerns the education sector is the most recent part uh, because, as I mentioned earlier, it started as a financial transaction using the cryptocurrency. But then, uh, I mean, the developers saw uh, that there is a huge potential for it in all different sectors, uh, the entertainment industry, as well as the education sector. Uh, so, so, yeah, um, we are now in 2020, even though, you know, we are facing some challenging times, you know, with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but you know what? In fact, uh, it's kind of a blessing in disguise in the sense that with COVID-19, all of the universities have gone online, okay? Uh, and all of a sudden, uh, most of the lecturers and the academic staff who probably they haven't even done any online lecture, suddenly they had to learn all the tricks about online uh you know lectures the google meet zoom whatever and yeah so the need for an online platform has has changed really so the perception uh is that blockchain will really play a very important role in, in, in education you're talking about exams lectures webinars seminars uh assessments certificates tutoring system everything basically uh, so yeah, I think the future is really uh, promising when, when it comes to blockchain. And as you guys all can see that uh, these are the must knowns about the blockchain technology that the Bitcoin, that was the, 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 the first basically uh, um, transaction, you know, when it comes to uh, the, the cryptocurrency, that, that's what it all started. And the DLT, this is a very important term that uh, probably uh, some, some people they are not really familiar with the DLT that stands for distributed ledger technology. This is the digital system in which the blockchain technology uh, operates. The, the transactions of assets it uses all the DLT and of course the crypto uh, currency. Yes. All right. So thank you, Doctor Miss Jazila. I would like, and we would all like, like since I speak on behalf of my viewers, our viewers. Uh, what are the terms that are important for any person who would like to speak about blockchain? What must they know? Uh, I have been having a lot of questions, but somebody <laughs> is asking about DLT. Can you explain yeah. from your point of view what DLT is? Sure. Uh, the distributed ledger system in a layman term is um, the best example for me, at least, is you have Google Docs, right? So Google Docs allows everyone to have access to the document at one go. Whatever the person does on the document, or edit the document, you kind of know what's happening on the document. So essentially, if you want to think of a distributed ledger system, it's similar to that, whereby everything is transparent. Um, if you want to change something, you're probably going to refer back to how it was originally. And it's also good to know that there is a difference between cryptocurrency and blockchain. I will admit that being in the industry, especially in Malaysia, you will always get confused between the two. A lot of people sometimes have a very bad um, experience with cryptocurrency. And I always need to tell people, you know, blockchain is a technology. It's what makes, um, you know, your digital assets but it's not cryptocurrency, so it's not a negative thing. So anyone who's actually going to read up on it, please make sure that you know the difference between technology-wise and the cryptocurrency side of it. Yeah. 
All right, all right. Thank you so much. So, if we were to speak about cryptocurrency, doctor, what would the how do we define the meaning in simple words for our students? What is the meaning of cryptocurrency, and what kind of currencies do we have? Is it just one, two, three? What kind of currencies do we have? I think this question is is, is best answered to Jazila. Actually, this is purely <laughs> yes. financial. I'm an academic, you know. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, okay, so cryptocurrency is a very it's a very uh, interesting thing at the moment, right? Uh, recently, even the Securities Commission of Malaysia has uh, given up licenses to three exchanges to actually have proper, you know, platforms to trade in cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies, you have many different kinds. Of course, everyone knows Bitcoin that you know fluctuates to crazy amounts. And if you turn back time to about four years or five years ago, um, it's probably worth a few cents to be very fair. There are a lot of horror stories uh, where someone traded a hundred Bitcoin for pizza. And you know, you don't imagine that now because you know the value of it. But yeah, so essentially, if any of you are interested, there are um, very good websites right now that are backed up by Securities Commission. Uh, you have Luno, you have Tokenize, you have Synergy. So whatever it is, I'm not going to advise anyone to purchase anything because that'll be against the law. Uh, but before going into anything, do not really believe everyone when it comes to, oh, you should invest in this, tomorrow you're going to get 500 and get more. Please be very careful. There are a lot of um, scam WhatsApp groups, Telegram groups, and all that. Please find the right information. Um, there are people in the community in Malaysia, specifically like uh, Bitcoin Malaysia. Uh, we've worked with them before uh, with Asia Blockchain Review, and they always try to give the sound knowledge that you need. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Cryptocurrency, it fluctuates. There are many different types. You have Ethereum, you have Luno, you have all kinds of things like that, right? So, hope that answers it. <laughs> Uh, I did actually do my research before we came into this webinar and I was wondering how much is one Bitcoin because as I know a Bitcoin is the most famous type of currency in the cryptocurrency world. So uh, do you have an answer for that? Maybe you would like, maybe doctor or Mr. Zero would like to, how much is one Bitcoin actually, um, in the I, Malaysia market? Okay, I, I don't really check on it as much because it's quite, it's quite sad because I was in the industry when it was really cheap. <laughs> But I don't know, I, I think it's a few thousand dollars, uh, but based on perception of people, you don't have to buy one whole Bitcoin, by the way. You can buy 0 0.00 marks. Just in case you guys are wondering, you know, like, how does anyone afford to buy one Bitcoin? Um, the early players need to buy a very small amount. And as the small amounts grow, they get to one Bitcoin. So you don't really have to buy one whole Bitcoin, by the way. That's just my take. All right. All right, thank you so much. Now, Doctor, uh, we would like to know, uh, is blockchain secure? Is it secure? Is it safe? Uh, yes, there are lots of pros, like Ms. Jazira was saying, and you should be careful, but is it safe generally? Well, the, definitely, yes, uh, Tara, because, uh, again, it basically stores information or data uh, in the form of a block. I mean, of course, it's not like a physical block here, but uh, you're talking about a, a set of data and, and, and this data will be actually, uh, will have its own um, hash and it will be actually connected through a, a chain of also a set of database into another block. So, uh, I mean, when it comes to transactions, for example, uh, it is nearly impossible actually to, 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 uh, to trace back that transaction because it has been locked in a way that uh, you, you can never undo it. So same thing for the education sector, yes. Uh, I mean, for us, the student information, the privacy of, 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 uh, of the student's credentials is, is, is essential. And uh, of course, you're dealing with international students, so you have their passports, their immigration uh, information. These are all very sensitive uh, issues. And not to mention uh, some students, they might have, uh, you know, like uh, problems, uh, uh, so uh, the counseling part also, so uh, by adopting the blockchain technology, uh, you will ensure that the security and the robustness of, of, of storing and sharing your information, it is, it is, is, is quite there actually. And uh, one way to do so is uh, yeah, by adopting it, uh, because I'll give you an example, you know, for us, Student Central, 
um, we we deal with the, um, verifying the, the the credentials of the of the students, right? Especially those who are actually uh, newcomers. Uh, there are some cases. I'm not saying here in our universities, but uh, you might probably heard that there are many cases of um, you know academic transcript fraudulence, and this is a rather a, a serious issue. So uh, you know, by adopting a manual system uh, or the old-fashioned way, you know, where the institute actually will contact that other institute and verify, and it takes at least two to three weeks for them to go back. Uh, there's always the element of human error here. Uh, but once you have, uh, I mean, a system as, as solid and robust as the blockchain that actually adopts the, a machine learning technology, basically, uh, the, the verification of the credentials is quite safe, fast, and definitely secure. Yes. Okay, thank you so much, Doctor. Now, uh, me being me, I can't stop myself from doing that. I actually want to greet all of the audience that we have today. Uh, so many of them, most of them actually are my, like, my beloved students, and I'm so happy that they are here. And to my surprise, these guys and girls, they actually know how much is a Bitcoin. And they are telling that a Bitcoin is around 38,000 Malaysian ringgit to 41,000 Malaysian ringgit. Well, guys, uh, you're getting an A. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for being here. Stay tuned. Uh, Ms. Jazila, if I wanted to ask you, how does blockchain affect our future life? What would you have to say about that? Well, it's something that initially, you know, when you talk about blockchain, or even if you Google blockchain, right, you see benefit. You know, everyone knows the benefits of blockchain. But if you want to be realistic about it, you can actually see the current trends at this point. Uh, for example, in the Philippines, uh, one of our partners that we worked with before, uh, which I'm actually going to show you, is actually uh, Union Bank. So, as I mentioned before, you know, cryptocurrency is very much different than blockchain technology itself. Essentially, the fundamentals are the same. You know, it's immutable. Um, you know, in order for you to hack it, you might have to have a 51% stake on hacking it. So, for people like Union Bank, who actually saw a high amount of an unbanked market that you know didn't have your typical banking services. For example, um, if I were in a rural area in the Philippines, it takes me about 52 steps to actually transfer a certain amount of money. And that could fluctuate from three days to a month. That is unthinkable for Malaysia, right? Because you know we don't really have that much um, rural banks or issues because the country is pretty much connected with maybe what five to eight banks around there. But in the Philippines, their issue was that how do you connect the unbanked market? And it's really simple when you think about it. When it comes to blockchain, like Dr. Saad was saying, you have information about a person in a token, right? And that token is verified from one bank to another. So instead of taking 52 steps, you already have their information. The only thing was that they had to work with a hundred different banks. And Union Bank successfully applied it, and it's actually called I2I, which is the system where they transfer money uh, seamlessly. And ever since um, COVID-19, unfortunately, like you were mentioning, it's a silver lining for a lot of people because with systems like that, it allowed them to be more um, productive in terms of transferring money, purchasing, and even sending money back home. And where it's going for blockchain from what I see is something like that, you know? The everyday man is not going to see the system. He's just going to use it. He's going to use it and he's just going to see the benefits of it. It's like the internet. You key in a keyword, but you don't really want to know the metrics behind it. Like, why did it come out in that point? Because it's so seamless. So for me, when it comes to blockchain technology, we're definitely heading there. and. It's just a matter of time, but you might not even notice it. Yeah. <laughs> the thing with what's going on around the world today, it's kind of like, I don't know, it's kind of like unbelievable. One day we were all reading textbooks and complaining we do not want online learning because we love to see our teacher. And the other day, everybody is online. So like what you said, it could happen without you even realizing it because 
you just have to move into that direction one way or another. Now, uh, doctor, we would like to ask your good self about, like, I know that you've been preparing uh, lots of ways that blockchain actually is going to transform education in the upcoming future. Um, would you like to share that with us mm, so that we get to know what kind of ways is blockchain going to transform the future of higher education? system in general I mean from a primary school all the way to a PhD level um, so of course uh, the first point that um, we need to stress upon is the transcripts and as I mentioned earlier that the verification of the transcript any student who comes to any college uh, the first thing that uh, that the, the Institute will do is the verification of the transcript how how eligible is that student and whether uh, you know all the transcripts and the uh, certificates are uh, verified so um, again you know many universities until this day they are still following the traditional system of uh, verifying the transcripts whereas blockchain can definitely change all that by providing open infrastructure uh, for creating storing viewing and sharing uh, these transcripts uh, across multiple uh, platforms and again it uses actually the DLT uh, solution uh, and of course um, this is one thing that uh, makes the university uh, I mean especially the future universities if they start employing this technology it will definitely uh, create a world of, 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 of difference I mean the, the reputation of the university will definitely uh, I mean, people will look at it in, in the sense that, um, I mean, they, they can actually really tackle multiple and complex uh, issues. So the transcripts is one of them. The second uh, point that blockchain can and definitely will change the education sector is the creation of badges, digital badges to be specific. I mean, probably uh, many people, they don't know what is it actually. A digital badge is basically an, um, it's a collection of specific uh, type of information related to the education uh, of that particular student. For example, you're talking about your transcripts, your academic transcripts. So in instead of uh, submitting, for example, uh, your four years of, of, of bachelor's degree, your uh, three years of high school, uh, your two, the three, four years of master's um, degree and so on, it can all be uh, um, uh, somehow uh, minimized into one badge, which is basically will be called as, as a block actually. And this badge, it, it can be shared across uh, multiple platforms and uh, it will make, you know, the, 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 the sharing and the ver verification of these badges uh, very easy actually and it helps not only in the education but also in the employment you know a student when it graduates it becomes an uh, alumnus right so that alumnus would like to you know uh, be employed in, in a company or even probably in the, the same university that he or she was, was studying on so yeah the presence of these badges makes it a lot more easier to share the information uh, if, I may, uh, sorry, if I may uh, interfere, um, so many people actually do have a problem with you going back to your university, let's say after 40 years, you want to be employed somewhere else, and then you have to go back to your original country, and to get your original certificate stamped, so on and so forth. And in today's world, most of us do not actually live in our own countries. So having a blockchain will actually enable us to have our ready-made certificate that was published 40 years ago <laughs> very easily and it's like authentic and you do not have to go back and certify it, take it and all of this. All right, thank you. Uh, we move on, Doctor, to the next point. Yeah, so uh, the student records, I already mentioned that point that uh, there are so many companies like, as you all can see, the Sony Global Education, they have developed an education platform uh, in partnership with uh, IMB that uses and secures students' records. So it's not only actually the, uh, the badges or the, the transcripts or the certificates, but rather the record of that student throughout his or her entire student journey. The moment they register up until they graduate, everything in between can be stored, you know, from attendance, 
uh, from uh, participating in, in curricular and extracurricular classes, the assessment, the, the, the exam results, and, and, and many other uh, things, even like the, the counseling records of that students, everything can be stored in a very systematic uh, way, actually. Identity, uh, what do we mean by that? Is basically, uh, there are also many companies who are using or starting to, to, to develop such uh, technology it basically uh, it, it, it characters it, it characterizes uh, what we call uh, the identity of the student. For example, if that student has a, a certain badge, a certain uh, you know set of database, it will create a, a kind of identity of that student. So, like for example, it's somehow it's like you know the, the QR code is just a code, right? But inside of it, you have. Uh, huge amount of, of data stored in it. It's something similar, but of course it's, it's, it's more complex than that. But I mean, the blockchain has the ability to create an identity for each individual student, and it actually, it makes it customizable uh, for them. So can w whatever type of information that you want to retrieve, even after 10 years, 20 years uh, later, it can be done very easily, actually. Uh, the infrastructure security is also one way that blockchain enables, uh, uh, I mean, the education sector. I mean, of course, not only the education sector, but all the other types. But since we're talking about universities here, that uh, sharing the security and uh, it, it needs actually a, a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, manpower and, and, and technological uh, uh, infrastructure. So blockchain also offers the opportunity uh, for, for, for this kind of information to, to be shared in a very secure uh, format. I mean, especially the security of the campus, for example, anything that goes wrong, the student hostel, uh, all of these, of course you have, I mean, like CCTV cameras, but, but in order for you to collectively uh, monitor these uh, I mean, cameras in different locations and come up with a, a metrics or analysis of these data, it's, it's, it's also a huge task, so blockchain offers uh, that. And the other point is the uh, ride sharing, uh, which basically, uh, it's, it's kind of like a, like a market uh, place that offers all the tools for certain type of students, especially those who are uh, like physically challenged, special needs, you know, those students with dyslexia, okay? There are many students like that. So uh, you don't want to discriminate them. You want to, in fact, you want to offer them the exact same experience as other students. So blockchain offers that, that, the tools uh, for that by, again, by sharing their information or make it uh, I mean, the classroom or any type of assessment for them a lot more uh, easily uh, accessible. Um, cloud storage, of course, now everything is in the cloud and uh, you know, the, the technology is there, definitely. It's been there for at least for the past 10 years. But blockchain uh, makes it a lot more secure when it comes to storage and sharing and verification of the data of the students. And, uh, I mean, many companies are actually uh, able to, to develop what we call blockchains, temper-proof ledgers to share the security data uh, across multiple uh, institutes, including universities. And the um, uh, energy, yes. If, if, if I may, uh, Ms. Jazila, what do you have to say about the cloud storage? Because I did actually see that it was a much of a bigger topic and maybe it needs its own time. But what do you think of the cloud storage? Why is blockchain good for the cloud storage? Well, basically, when you think about, um, like Dr. Sao was saying, when you want to transfer information, and at least there is somewhere that everyone is connected, you can see what's going on. But I do have to say, um, I just need to add on about the part about a public key and a private key here, right? Because everyone, if we were to go into that system where you have an identification of one person, that means that person is actually responsible for his account. So in theory, if we were to do something like that, just like how you have a bank account, you require a code, right? A password of your own. So it's not as simple as how we do it in a banking system in this current time. If you were to lose your password, you just go to the bank and you apply for your password to be given to you, right? 
Uh, I do have to say that when it comes to this kind of system where you would consider everyone's responsible for their own accounts, uh, that becomes tricky because there are certain wallets, for example, uh, universal wallets that store cryptocurrency where one person has their own account. If you lose your password, you literally lose your password. So whatever that's in your account, whatever information that's in there, um, it's not retrievable, right? Because we, if you are going for that blockchain um, ecosystem where it's a private uh, system where you don't want anyone to know about your information, you are accountable for it. And you know, if you lose that, that's a problem there. So in this new generation, there are many different iterations of how we can do it. You know, you have your private chains, your public chains. If you're going to make a private chain where you know the cloud storage can keep certain information, there are terms and conditions that you can kind of work around if your customers or the person is agreeable that, oh, if I were to lose my account, um, they are allowed to have my information so they can, you know, retrieve it if, say, touch wood, I lose my password. So it really depends on the company that wants to do it. And it's becoming more evolved. It's no longer the old system where um, no one touches my information. If I lose it, I'm sorry, I lost 50 Bitcoin because I lost my password. And it's really up to the person at this point in time. And if you read more about it, uh, you'll understand the difference between a public and a private blockchain system. Well, thank you, Ms. Jazila. And the way that you said, touch wood if I lose my password, it brings me to this. Uh, the other day I was watching a drama and actually that, at that drama, he was telling that uh, we have become this and to th by this he's referring to the phone. We have become this and this has become us. And if we lose, we wake up. And my goodness, I have nothing to say. Doctor, would you like to continue with uh, number eight, if you may? So, uh, energy management, I mean, one of the applications for blockchain, uh, this is more specifically um, towards, uh, you know, industry driven uh, colleges and faculties, you know, like engineering uh, and IT, uh, you know, whereby they deal with a certain type of uh, like projects that involve, for example, uh, water filtration system, uh, like, um, I mean, re reactors or like electricity uh, powerhouses. So, you know, sharing this type of energy uh, by eliminating the intermediaries, uh, it actually, and, and centralizing it into one uh, hub, it makes a lot of difference. And definitely blockchain can, can help uh, that. I mean, students who are, you know, like working on certain projects that involves energy, yeah, the sharing of the information and the sharing of the energy itself across uh, multiple uh, blocks or multiple uh, places uh, can, can definitely help. The blockchain can help uh, in managing that. Yeah. Uh, you have the prepaid cards, which sounds kind of like a, like a mobile uh, data, actually. But it's, <laughs> like more, into, <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's more into actually um, learning experiences uh, that, like, for example, some cities, especially in rural areas, remote places, uh, schools and families, uh, they can actually purchase these kind of cards and in it there are certain type of information stored, uh, you know, those who cannot like go to, to, to campuses or to school itself. So yeah, you actually, you, you bring the school to them, okay, in, in a sense, okay. So, uh, and definitely I can see the future uh, is, is going towards that. Uh, the smart contracts, uh, basically the DLT can also automatically execute uh, agreements and uh, and, it, and it usually uh, it's called actually a smart contract a series of students and teachers for example they check in and they uh, I mean they are key to executing a certain series of smart contracts and validate attendance the, the, the thing here is that validating the attendance is also such a troublesome um, task really because it also it is prone to many errors and I mean, probably you guys know that some students, they proxy signing to others, right? Which is a big headache for us, you know. Errors, uh, yes, yes. the mm, students yes, know better. Yes. So yeah, this, this blockchain can definitely uh, can, can, can trace all that, can trace all that. The marketplace is also a, a D DLT based system that can eliminate the uh, middlemen. It will also allow uh, courses, you know, like for example, uh, books, uh, I mean, students, of course, they, they, they all require books, textbooks for their studies, for their assignments. 
so it's like a common uh, place whereby you can view, you can share, uh, you can even buy or sell your books once you graduate. Um, so, so yeah, it, it provides a, a platform. There are certain softwares that deals with that also, uh, but you know, blockchain you know, has the ability to do that as well. Uh, record management, uh, everything. I mean, the, the past few years, everything was paper based. And you know, with the revolution of internet, suddenly everything has been digitized. But digitization alone is not enough. You need to make sure that all the digitized files are stored safely and shared fast with an error-free uh, rate. Now, the retail part, um, probably uh, Jazila can can talk to us about this retail. Uh, maybe uh, in, in the sense of. Um, well, what are the applications uh, of it? Sure. Uh, so basically, if you talk about peer-to-peer -peer network systems where it uses blockchain, that is essentially where cryptocurrency started off, right? Um, a lot of the times, a long time ago, when a currency of a particular country drops, the value drops, and there's nothing to safeguard them. And that was how a few countries actually figured out a way to transfer your money into cryptocurrency. So essentially, it's something like you're keeping the value of your of your asset, right? But it's in a digitized version. And peer to peer, when it comes to retail, it can go as simple as you give me your public key and I transfer money to your public key, and the transaction is done. You know, it could be as simple as that. Uh, other ways of retail that are still being tested. Um, I'm sorry. I have drilling in my house right now, apparently. But but yeah, so basically, the one that's still being tested at this point is payment via POS systems. So there are some countries that actually allow you to take your phone and connect it to your um, crypto wallet and pay. It's as simple as that. So it doesn't really matter which country you're from. Uh, it goes based on the market rate that is stated with your wallet that is put there. And you know, you don't really have to go call your bank and to tell them that, you know, I want to open my, my account and do it, right? So it's as simple as that. Okay. Yeah, definitely. And uh, that brings us to point number 14, charity. And uh, as you all know that, you know, universities around the world, actually, they, they always, um, you know, like uh, advocate for a charity, you know, to provide, for example, to support uh, uh, certain projects, uh, you know, in support of World uh, Health Day, the World Hepatitis Day, uh, World Cancer Day, all, all of these, uh, or for example, children who are suffering from uh, a certain type of diseases. So, you know, like uh, universities are, are, are those kind of institutes that um, of, of course, uh, they, they value the, 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 the human spirit and uh, charity is one of those uh, events that you know allows people to come together and, and, and you know give back to society. So blockchain offers the platform actually to uh, you know w when you donate, of course you have to make a transfer, right? So it, it offers the, the platform to uh, transfer, track, and provide permanent records for for for, for that transaction. Uh, and of course it will make the 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 job or the, the, the work of the charity organizations a lot more easier. So yeah, it, is also, it, it also provides some credibility because normally people are afraid to give donations for fear that the money will go somewhere else. So if you are unable to change the data and if you are able to track where did that money actually go to, then this is a form of credibility and most probably people would want to donate actually. Absolutely, absolutely, yes. Um, human resources, of course, any institute has their uh, HR department. And when it comes to uh, educational institutions, uh, of course, from uh, the point of appointing a lecturer, for example, of course, you need to verify the records of the lecturer. We don't only verify the records of the students, but I mean, how do you know that this, this person claims to be a doctor or uh, who has a, a master's or a PhD in a certain field, right? So uh, again, usually HRs, they will you know, verify their, uh, the records of their future or potential employees the traditional way. But if they uh, employ the blockchain technology, 
um, this will make it a lot more easier. Uh, okay, that you know by by by, by applying it, um, verification it will be a lot more faster and secure. Okay, and the libraries, of course, the, this is a very important point. Actually, at every university, a library is actually the beating heart of every university. And I remember back in the days when we were students. Uh, unfortunately, there was no internet. Okay, I wish there was, but there was no internet. <laughs> okay, I mean, it was very at, at, at its early days. You know, only Wikipedia back then. So still, we used to go back. You know, the old school style. Well, you, you go in the library and open the physical book, which was fun, by actually. Um, so now everything has been digitized. Of course, the physical books are still there. But all the books have been converted into ebooks. But even the ebooks, you need a very, um, um, you know, very clever and very fast tracking system to, you know, to monitor. Uh, I mean, who is taking these uh, books? I mean, what, what, what time the, the, they were returned and, and so on. So the blockchain definitely can offer uh, that to uh, to ensure that the work of the libraries is a lot more uh, easier. Publishing, as an academic staff, any academic institution, publication is one of our most important uh, key performance indexes. We need to publish at least one paper a year, whatever research that we have done. So, uh, and, and there are thousands and thousands of, of, of journals out there and so many different rankings that the tier one, tier two, tier three, so it is actually, it can be overwhelming to choose what type of uh, journal you want to publish your work so blockchain it has this uh, algorithms that actually um, connect you or um, can publish your paper or your article in a um, in a, as a in a seamless actually uh, format it really is a game changer when it comes to the publishing of, of scientific and even uh, i mean any kind of academic uh, work actually Public assistance, probably, I think, uh, Jizila can um, highlight uh, on that, the public assistance, the role of blockchain in that. Sorry, I have, to, I have to record it so to like, go off a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I was telling you that, yeah, the, the, the public assistance, I mean, the yep. role of, of blockchain in, in, in public uh, assistance. What, what, what do you think from uh, from so, your point of view? From my point of view, especially in Malaysia, I'm not sure whether um, everyone is aware of what's happening. Is uh, the Ministry of Science and Technology and Innovation um, actually kind of gave a statement uh, that they would be doing um, halal traceability and also zakat traceability using a blockchain system. Uh, the reason why they wanted to use halal traceability and zakat traceability is because there's always a question of is the money going to the right place? So when you're talking about, um, you know, when it comes to public service and helping the industry and the community, it can be done. And I'm happy to say Malaysia is stepping in that direction. Um, probably in another six months, they're going to come up with a solid plan on how to do that. And by implementing that, it means that everyone can see where their money goes. All right, so thank you so much, Dr. Saad, for these 18 uh, quite lavish points that you have shared with us about how blockchain actually is going to change the future of higher education. Um, now we move on to the section that everybody is awaiting. That is the Q&A section, right? Uh, I am going to display the questions and maybe your good self or Miss Jazila will be able to explain. I have gone through the questions and most of them actually are not related to education. So I am very sure that Miss Jazila is going to be able to help. Uh, we start with this question from Mr. Lotfi Halim. Can you explain more about distributed ledger technology initiatives in Malaysia and its relation with Education Revolution 4.0? Sure. So uh, basically, you can actually Google MDEC and MOSTI at this point in time. MDEC does have a budget that supports digitization. And one of the many pillars that you're focusing on is blockchain technology. Apart from AI, blockchain is the next big thing for us. Um, in terms of support, I mean, you can really see the change. Um, you have 
companies like Money Match in Malaysia that openly say that they do cross-border transfers with blockchain technology because number one, it does cut off the time frame for them. Um, it's not necessarily a cheap system, which people always feel as though if I were to plug and play a blockchain system, uh, it means it's cheap, not necessarily. Uh, that's the reason why the government is actually giving grants to see how you're going to digitize and how you're going to implement it. And it is heading towards that 4.0 revolution, especially for um, supply chains, traceability of that. Like I mentioned, um, the reason why Malaysia wants to do a halal blockchain system is because for Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, we all have different halal standards. And when we export out, we have to meet the criteria of each country. So by applying a blockchain system, you already kind of put a check mark. Okay, so this brand has gone through this kind of test and it applies to the same test that you guys require. So instead of having to fill in your you know, typical forms and you go through the process, you already have a token that you kind of trade it to other countries and say, I want to export here and these are the proofs that I have. So yeah, thank you so much, our Mr. Lutfi Halim. And actually, Mr. Lutfi Halim is our colleague, and we are very, very happy to have him. He's the head of school, the School of Business and Accountancy at MAIC. So his second question is, can you tell us more about Gold X, which is made for crypto investors that can be traded with Bitcoin or Ethereum? And how can we exploit it? His last part is like, how can we exploit it? <laughs> so, um, very Asian, yes, we try to find the loopholes of that. Um, I can't give any financial advice because no one can at this point in time unless you are one of the many exchanges. So basically what uh, Mr. Lutfi Halim is asking is, you know, what is Gold X? So Gold X is a token um, that is sold to people. So basically you can purchase, um, you know, startup companies tokens and read the rewards after right um one example if you guys know is hello gold so hello gold started off with a similar concept you know they sell the tokens and then as it progresses in value you sell it back and you make an income out of that um yes crypto investors can purchase via bitcoin and ethereum or whatever they accept at that time um, but like I mentioned, I'm not too familiar with Gold X because, you know, there's so many available at this time and I'm not sure how you're going to exploit it, but all the best in doing so. But yeah, so pretty much um, just for everyone's knowledge, you know, what kind of, what are tokens actually? Because sometimes people think tokens are just cash, but it's actually investment things. All right. We have also Mr. Kelvin Lim and he's also our co from MAIC and he wanted to ask if we are starting to use cryptocurrency now is it make a does it make a huge impact like uh, the cryptocurrency does it make a huge impact on us um okay so for Malaysia we are still in the process of adoption we've got some licenses from Securities Commission uh, but the best country I can actually give you an example for this kind of thing is Japan because digital assets are considered taxable are considered assets, are considered, you know, your fundamental income. Uh, are we heading there? Yes, definitely. But at this point in time, there are a lot of details that are still in transition. You know, uh, we are all waiting for the guidelines from Bank Nagara and from Securities Commission. But from my understanding, it's going there. I think if you were to see how the youth in this group chat right now are asking about it, uh, it's definitely the next generation of uh, investments for the younger Crowd. I mean, if I were to explain it to my mother, she'd probably say, uh, I don't get it. I'm not even sure what miners are. I thought miners are for gold. So yeah, so it's definitely going to be a huge impact in future. Okay, and our Mr. Lutfi Halim, he also, uh, Mr. Lutfi Halim is actually very well known to be very well versed in, in an array of topics. I have seen him comment on various topics and various webinars. So it's quite, quite, I'm, I'm always happy to see when he joins our webinar. Uh, what is the procedure, what are the procedures to apply for license from regulators such as Security Commission to operate and establish digital asset exchanges in Malaysia? Okay, so this is a really interesting topic last year. Uh, last year, why I mentioned is because that was the first time that um, digital exchanges were going to be regulated. Why I say last year is because, to be honest, digital exchanges have been present ever since Bitcoin and Ethereum started gaining traction. It's just that 
nothing was really being regulated because no one really saw whether you know should i what what should i do i mean it's not cash i'm not going to tax it and what is what are the benefits or the pros and cons but because the traction is pretty high and we do have quite a number of malaysian people who hold cryptocurrency there was a potential to of course get it regulated and licensed because at the same time, when things like this come out, you have a lot of scammers that come into the picture. And I'm sure you've all read on the papers, you know, someone got scammed of their life savings, said that someone will buy them Bitcoin when essentially you don't need anyone to buy you Bitcoin, you can do it yourself. So when SC did that, uh, I believe from my understanding that a lot of them had to show credibility, like where were their fundings coming from and all that kind of things. Um, it's similar to how when you want to start a bank, they probably, in my opinion, did the same thing. And uh, there was about 47 applicants for last year, but only the three um, that have been announced this year are fully regulated. And you can go check them out. They're legal, so hopefully people will be more open to it. All right, we have a question from Mr. Lansida Diawara, and he's actually a student for the Bachelors of Business Administration. He was asking about the importance of blockchain and how does the Bitcoin work? If we can get this like in a summary. Uh, I think Dr. Saad gave so many great uh, examples, right, uh, of the importance of blockchain technology. I'm going to add technology so we don't get confused with cryptocurrency. Um, how Bitcoin works? Well, layman terms, it's just digital money, In if you really want to know an opinion of it. Um, value comes from the market, right? So if, for example, a lot of people were to say, ah, it's not a value, it's going to be $100 tomorrow. It could be that, you know. That is the reason why there are no statistics behind how much is Bitcoin going to be. And that is the question I get all the time. Should I buy now? Is it going to be cheaper tomorrow? Or what is the next step? It's all decentralized. So it really depends on the market. All right. Uh, one more question for Mr. Lotfi. What? is the what are the changes in malaysia to have bitcoin as one of the main trading currencies in malaysia such as a challenge from our central bank bank negara what are the panel views about this what do you think are there challenges actually for us to start using bitcoin in malaysia uh i would say definitely i mean at this point in time we are just at the adoption phase of it you know and we don't really have any platform at this point that is going to be seamless. Like right now, our fintech have been making amazing progress. You have Boost, you have GrabPay and all that kind of stuff. And everyone just kind of adopts it naturally. Our uh, challenges in Malaysia is, of course, the education. How are you going to tell um, a certain age group that may not be familiar with this exactly what are they investing in or what kind of ways are they going to you know, use Bitcoin? Because there are many different, like I said, tokens. You have the investor tokens, you have the normal tokens, and there are so many things. So the challenge is really education. And like people talking about it, like Dr. Sa and Masa talking about it, makes it easier for you know scammers to get by people as well, because you understand the difference and you can protect yourself later on. Uh, but in terms of Banagar, I'm not exactly sure what is their next step, but I wouldn't be surprised if we were taxed for <laughs> cryptocurrency in the near future. All right, uh, another question from Mr. Lutfi, which like I have seen many students actually also are interested in knowing, can you explain the difference between Bitcoin and Ethereum? Which one is better? Ooh, that's very subjective. So <laughs> you have the Bitcoin people who really are, are full on Bitcoin people because, you know, it, it's, it's a pioneering cryptocurrency, you know, and everyone knows that if you are an early adopter, you're probably making a lot of profit out of it. But uh, Ethereum has other platforms to do. You have DeFi that you can use Ethereum. And there are other ways to utilize it as well. Uh, but that is another story, you know, because <laughs> DeFi is like a whole different universe. Uh, that would be very much a financial topic. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if you guys have any questions for that, you can definitely Google what DeFi does and what Ethereum does and so on and so forth. All right. How do you see the outlook for fintech industry in Malaysia, especially post COVID-19 era in the next five to 10 years to come? Dr. Saad, what do you feel? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, 
Okay. Well, uh, I think uh, definitely uh, uh, the blockchain technology uh, will play a, a huge role. I'll, I'll just give you an example. You know, like 20 years ago, uh, if, if you tell someone that uh, online shopping will be the, <laughs> the norm of shopping, people will probably laugh at you, you know? Yeah, so any new technology that comes, people uh, should not be afraid of it. They should actually embrace it because technology, it's just a way to enhance our lives. It's not a substitute for who we are. It just enhances our lives. So same thing with blockchain technology. In, in terms of the education uh, sector, it plays a huge role, really. Storing, sharing, verifying information across multiple platforms. This is definitely uh, the future. I see it. And I mean, from my capacity uh, as the head of Student Central, I mean, uh, I, I see the applications of it are endless, really. Uh, there are so many problems that we face on daily basis, attendance, records, assessments, uh, private information, complaints, uh, counseling. All of these can be actually summed up in one uh, platform, which is blockchain. And uh, yes, it will make actually our lives a lot more easier. So definitely the future is there. And I think to end uh, this, I will give you uh, the idea or the imagine the thought of a blockchain university. I'll leave it to you guys actually to imagine what a blockchain university will look like because definitely <laughs> it will happen. For the next five or 10 years, I bet you that this concept, you will hear it a lot, a blockchain university. Think about it. Actually, doctor, to my humble knowledge, there is a university by the name of Wolf something, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. They came yes. up with the idea of a blockchain university, but then they took it away. I'm not so sure why. Maybe we will find out very, very soon. Uh, sure. Collins is our student from the Bachelor's of Business Administration as well. And he says, does it mean that the information stored in blockchain cannot be lost? And if there is any unforeseen circumstances, I mean, what happens? Like, really, it can be lost? Miss Jazila said, touch wood. <laughs> you can. You can lose it if you lose your, your own private key. I mean, that is a personal part of it, right? Uh, but at the same time, I do have to point out there is that 51% rule. Um, I guess you guys can Google that. 51% uh, rule or attack is basically say for example someone with a supercomputer decides to hack into your blockchain system and they take over 51 percent of the blocks and they change that 51 percent of blocks to represent whatever block that they want but that being said you know some people assume it's going to take you 10 years to hack into a bitcoin system so you know it really depends on how you look at it right so yeah there are circumstances it can occur and that is the reason why i feel um cyber security is a big thing in the future because when you start doing uh, blockchain implementations for businesses you also need to test whether it's really working and that being said when you do a private blockchain it's not like a bitcoin blockchain where it's so huge that it's so decentralized but as you become smaller and more segmented based on the requirements that you have, you need to have that extra cybersecurity test, uh, making sure that things don't get changed without you knowing it. All right, Lancinet has a good question, which maybe when you read it, you'll be like, mm, mm, why did you ask such a question? But it is still confusing. What is the difference between blockchain, Bitcoin, and Ethereum, and so on and so on? Can you like just sum it up like in three, four sentences? Blockchain is what? And Bitcoin and Ethereum are what? Sure. So, okay. So, Bitcoin and Ethereum are cryptocurrencies. They are terms that you use for the cryptocurrencies. So, they are the money. Yes, correct. They are the money. So, if you go Google different type of tokens, they're still considered cryptocurrency. It's just that it's very famous, right? Bitcoin, it's like, ah, 35,000 ringgit for one. Obviously, that would be the most marketing exposure without having to do marketing. Um, but blockchain technology is what's behind it, which means like what was mentioned earlier in the talk, it's your uh, the different types of ledgers that you have that changes as more information get put into the system. So that's why blockchain technology itself is something that people are replicating for traceability solutions, for education, for fintech, because the immutable part of it is what makes it the most value. 
But Bitcoin and Ethereum, they're all considered cryptocurrencies. So we can say that blockchain is the system that is actually used to save information and data safely. And uh, cryptocurrencies and Ethereum are the coins, the money that we use to make purchases online, whether it was an online class, whether it was tuition fees for the university or doing some shopping online, right? All right. Thank you so much. Uh, Diawara said, is it possible to modify the data once it is written in a blog? I think you have uh, did answer the question just now, but maybe if you want to say something about it, the 51% rule. <laughs> 51% rule, you guys can Google. There are a lot of uh, hacking cases in 2019 based on that 51% rule. So it's, it's an interesting read because um, I, I mean, I would not say that a blockchain system is not hackable. It is. It is hackable. It's just, it's not easy. So yeah, it's a good read to actually um, read up on if you're into tech stuff. <laughs> okay. Ahmed is also our student from the uh, bachelor's of business administration as well he mm -hmm. says is is it possible in blockchain to remove one or more blocks from the network can you remove a block from the uh, technically it's not removing a block but what's inside the, the data that's inside the block right because those are the sequences that happen uh same thing not going to say it's 100 percent because it could be that someone has a supercomputer in future that could actually you know do that 51 percent rule thing but yeah so it can change information but there are requirements to do that okay mansoor and i know mansoor he has also he's a student of mine he's also for the bachelor's of business administration and mansoor also would like to add and maybe we hear your point of view that he personally thinks having your wallet connected to your phone can be good but it can invade your financial privacy do you or do you not agree what do you think uh to a certain extent i do agree but from a business perspective you know if you're looking at the mass market you want mass adoption it has to be something very seamless if you're going to tell me that we still have to use the old way which means i have a cold wallet and i have all my data on my cold wallet and i don't connect to the internet and i only do transfers certain times you know my codes and stuff like that it's not going to be an easy sell to the global market and blockchain, in terms of cryptocurrency, I do foresee it being something easily adopted, provided you know the countries and the nations know what to do and how to actually hold the kind of information there. Uh, yes, I'm, I do agree on the privacy part, but I'm on Facebook and there's no privacy there either. <laughs> Tell me about it. Uh, Surya here, he has this comment because Surya is my student and he was jumping with excitement yesterday when we were uh, when I said we're going to have a blockchain webinar because uh, he does some blockchain activities, actually, the basic ones he has told me or so he says. And his statement is blockchain is 100 percent secure. Yes or no? I'm always a person that says there's a first time for everything. So I'm not going <laughs> to. There is no yes for anything and no for something. Yeah. Yeah. You know, kids nowadays are smart. Um, who knows? The next generation could be way more advanced than what we are now. And there's always a way if there's, you know, if there's more technology in future. Okay. Warsami Omar Yusuf. He is also a bachelor of business administration. He's asking about what are the core requirements for a business blockchain? Like if you wanted to start a business using the blockchain, uh, the blockchain system, what, what are the requirements? Are there special requirements for that? Uh, well, being in a company that consults brands about you know blockchain technology, I do say yes, there are. Um, Sometimes people feel as though if you were to put in blockchain technology into their product, it means I can charge a higher amount when essentially they don't require the blockchain system. So that is definitely something that the company needs to look into. You know, do you have sensitive information you want to safeguard? Do you want to do seamless transactions? Or if it's something like, oh, I actually just want to know how many people buy my drinks. That's a totally different thing. You know, that could be a CRM system. So when it comes to blockchain technology, you really need to understand whether it is necessary for your business. Um, I would never recommend blockchain for everything. That, that makes no sense. Um, the system itself is to safeguard important documents. It's to make seamless transactions. It's to make things transparent for either you know, your stakeholders. But the requirements differ, definitely. 
But majority of the time, some things could be as simple as a CRM system. So we just need to see whether that's really important. Actually, the question that comes to my mind, like later when we go to class, I'm sure they're going to ask me this question. Might as well I ask it to you first. Um, is it easy to learn how to do the blockchain thingy? Is it uh, is this technology easy to be learned or is it very complicated? What, what is it actually? You What's mean, the story behind this? So there's different types, right? So are you talking about a coding perspective or yeah. are you talking about the crypto? Okay, so coding perspective, um, I would suggest students to actually look at uh, Corda. Or you can Google Corda, or you can Google, Google a few other seminars that are free that are actually more towards um, the kind of systems that are available. One that's available in Malaysia is NEM. I mean, they have to have at least some kind of digital background. You know, you have to at least know some JavaScript or something to that extent. Um, a lot of the times, the people that I've met a couple of years back, actually Google a lot of the things that they know because there aren't any you know specific courses at this point. There are many types that you know have the blockchain 101, crypto 101 and things like that. But it's always good to do your own um, research work of you know free courses that are actually available online um, and have a basic on your digital part of it. But yeah, pretty much that's about okay. it. Okay. Ed, you know, says, as a foreign student in Malaysia, am I permitted by law to do this kind of business? What do you mean what? by business? <laughs> so, uh, uh, I think uh, the Bitcoin trading, is this how we call it? Is this how we address it? Yeah. Um, well, you see, that is the part where it's a bit tricky, right? Because anything to do with big physical exchanges, you have to be licensed by security commission. So it's a very uh, dangerous topic to thread on for sure. Uh, but you know, it's not, I would not encourage anyone to scam anyone for sure. Um, anything to do with cryptocurrency, find the right sources, find the right people to talk about. Uh, but at this point, if you're talking about starting an exchange, no, you are not allowed to unless you are licensed. Okay. Uh, we are going to have to need to wrap up, but we take this question from Surya. He said, is that cryptocurrency will be used in future by everyone? Do you think that will happen? Possibly. I mean, I would like this to be so. Um, you know, being in the sphere, I, okay, for me, if you were to ask me right now, do I have physical Malaysian cash in my wallet? I don't because <laughs> into fintech, I scan everything. And, you know, cryptocurrency is just the next step of adoption. Uh, it's just how you look at it and how you can adopt it. But if, for example, one of the questions earlier on about privacy and all that kind of stuff arises, that is something that, you know, will be in the mix of when exactly are we going to adopt it. But whether it's going to go away, I highly doubt so, you know, because as long as you have countries that are globally affected and your currencies drop in rate, depending on you know what's happening at that time, this is definitely one of the things that you're going to be keeping, you know, at the end of the day, because currencies fluctuate, especially now with the COVID situation. All right, Ahmed says, can you give examples of some popular platforms for developing blockchain applications? Can you? Uh yeah, there, there are a few that I know of. Um, being Malaysian, I, I'm quite, I work quite closely with NEM, uh, NEM blockchain. So they are really friendly. Their offices in Malaysia, if you guys want to check them out. Um, you have other kind of platforms that can also help you with creating blockchain applications. Uh, one of it is Infinito Wallet. It's a, universal, it's a universal wallet solution. So what they do is literally they will give you the APIs to start an app and how to actually do it. So do your due diligence. I'm not saying any company is better than anyone, but you know, they are available in the market at this point. All right. Colin says, how would blockchain help an organization in terms of business transactions, HRM departments, and other relatives need of it? So okay. like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, Dr. Sai. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess. In terms of organization transactions, uh, think of it very easily, right? If you are a company in Singapore and you hired somebody in Japan or Malaysia, so on and so forth, and the person wants 
actually, you know, paid in cryptocurrency because he feels that it's a safer option. So that's a possible uh, way of doing it. HR, um, human resources is safe, like Dr. Salat mentioned, you know, when you already have your identity on a blockchain system, it's really hard to weasel your way out of it, right? Um, I think there are a lot of cases in the past where someone says they're from a different organization or they've worked here, but in actuality, in actuality they probably just did something very minor or something like that. So if everything was in that system, it would be easier. I mean, at this point, um, a lot of companies outsource their due diligence sector and that costs money. So if everybody just had this token on their heads that they just, you know, I want to apply for a job, I give it to you and you know everything, it'll be much seamless. Yeah. All right. So actually, we do have a lot more questions that are coming. Um, I have posted the link, guys, for you to obtain your e-certificate uh, that you can get, actually, because you have attended this webinar. I'm going, it, it is in the chat box below <laughs> to the side. All right. Okay. Um, before we leave, we can address very shortly the upcoming uh, leftover questions from um, Mr. Muhammad. Iftikhar, he says the role of blockchain in research, is it going to be, Dr. Saad, is it going to have any impact on the research industry? Because uh, you see like research requires a lot of uh, data, you know, you need to do a lot of uh, reading, a lot of uh, literature review. So, uh, and, and especially now with the new technology, like for example, I, I talk, uh, on um, my specialty, which is basically we deal with microbes and bacteria, and uh, especially now it's more relevant than ever, you know, with the COVID-19. So one of our research projects involves uh, identifying what is the microbial profile in a certain hospital. How many types of different bacteria and viruses are there in the beds, in the in the corridors, in the patients, uh, in the curtains, in the sinks? So uh, you know, we, we collect samples. And we analyze them using metagenomic uh, sequencing and the amount of data that is produced is huge uh, that uh, they are actually using supercomputers so if, if you want to collaborate uh, you know because usually research is always best when you collaborate with multiple uh, institutions and even different countries if you want to collaborate across countries you need a really robust system uh, to store data and ensure it seamlessly so definitely blockchain can, can help uh, that in, in real time, you know, sharing the data of research, whatever findings that you have, it can easily be shared in real time. And of course, it's secure because you don't want other people to, you know, steal your work, right? They will steal it and then they will like just publish it and they will take the credit while you, you have uh, done all the work. So yes, the potential for research is huge and uh, I can definitely see it. Um, and the other potential for uh, blockchain is not only for research, but also in the classroom. Uh, we, we all know that uh, probably you guys have heard of smart classrooms, uh, you know, whereby you, you apply certain types of softwares uh, to monitor attendance. Uh, of course, these are all great and it's been, been there in the market at least for the past uh, probably, I would say, five to, to seven years. But blockchain can actually connect all of these uh, different variables in one system and makes it, uh, I mean, the sharing of the information is, is, is a lot more easier, actually. Yeah, so definitely it is the future, for sure. Thank you, Doctor. Now, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome the Dean of the Faculty of Business, Finance and uh, IT, Ms. Michelle. Thank you so much for joining us for today. And she's happy with the topic. I'm so happy that she's happy with the topic. All right. Uh, Mr. Kingsley, he's also a student for the Bachelor of uh, Business Administration. He was actually asking, is blockchain different from banking ledger? And what are the drawbacks of blockchain? Uh, well, basically, they do have their own um, DLT systems, right? Because DLT essentially is just one of the pillars of the whole blockchain ecosystem. Uh, distributed ledger is not something that is new. It's actually been applied many, many years before. Um, the only difference is that, for example, um, when I was in telco, right, you have all this information about your customers, and they're all put in a server your own club, your own private service. So when that happens, you say, I don't know, one of my servers go down, all those customers that are in that server will be affected, right? 
And when that happens, it, it makes it really difficult for people to kind of give the right service or the best service because you're affected by a physical um, environment in a sense. In terms of having it on a blockchain, it's basically a digital platform where if anybody would try to mess around or fiddle with it, it requires a lot of effort, like I mentioned even before, a lot of you know changing and stuff that is not so easily done. Um, the drawbacks of blockchain, like I said, it's not a miracle pill that people like to think about. Uh, I have to be very, very honest, you know, being in the consulting part of it, um, I always have to tell them, you know, if you put in a blockchain system, it's not going to cure all your problems, for sure. You know, because like any technology, it will evolve as you progress. And the drawbacks is the education part of it. You know, how are you going to apply it? How are you going to actually get people to do a certain task in order for it to be recorded into your blockchain system? Uh, for example, uh, Wellface, which is a company that does traceability, and they do a blockchain system whereby you can trace from where their fruit are harvested, where are they sold, and how long have they been in the market? So you don't buy an old fruit, or if it's like it's mentions is 40 days old, it could be a copied QR code. But before you even go there, you actually have to see how are you going to get people to spend? You know, how are you going to get your consumers and your delivery guys to do that? So those are the drawbacks. You know, there are still human um, human elements involved when it comes to application. So you know, it varies from different companies, different industries. But yeah, that's one of the things. You know, it's the human element of it. I actually do like from from whatever that you've been trying to say. I do uh, always tell my students when I teach entrepreneurship that last time being an entrepreneur was something that was extra, something that you're privileged to be an entrepreneur, something like the cherry on your Sunday. But in today's global uh, marketplace and everybody's competing with everybody and all businesses are going online being an entrepreneur is not special anymore everybody must be an entrepreneur you don't become an entrepreneur forget about your business similar to blockchain today it may seem to us weird and scary and what is this all about but once we progress with this few upcoming years i think it's going to be just normal and what life without blockchain how was that <laughs> you know <Yeah. laughs> this type of question <laughs> All right. All right. Mujahid Abdullah says, how the legal issues in being tackled in, how are legal issues being tackled in blockchain? Yes. Okay. So for Malaysia itself, we have the Security Commission, we have Bainagar, we have a lot of government bodies that are making sure that our laws are close. So as it progresses, you know, eventually, um, back then, you know, there was, it's unthinkable of someone to sue somebody for, you know, stealing their Bitcoin, right? It's unthinkable because you, you're not really considering it an asset. But as it progresses, and the laws are put in place, you can actually do that. And if I'm not mistaken, um, last year, there was an incident where there was a wrong transfer. And it was brought to court. And there are a lot of now new police cases about it. So there are... Um, issues that can be brought to court at this point because it's a regulated, um, you know, in, in Bank Negara and Securities Commission point of view. Uh, sorry, I can't hear you. But okay, so the question itself. Um, oh, sorry. I said Thomas Elva Edison was asking, what do you yeah. think about eToro and Olymp trading? Uh, I can't comment on that because there was, a, there was a statement that came out from one of the government bodies about eToro and stuff. So I'm not going to, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't answer that one. Sure. All right. Thank you so much for the question. Moving on, we have Pascal. And Pascal is a business administration bachelor's uh, student, Pascal says, can someone have access to your blockchain information just using a wallet address? Well, in theory, of course, every digital crypto wallet will say no, um, because you know you have two different keys. Right? You have your private key, which is your own key to access your account. You don't give that to anyone. No matter what people say to you, like, oh, you can give me your private key, please. Never give your private key to anyone. Uh, and your public key is similar to like your bank account number, right? So if you want someone to transfer money into your account, you give them your public key, not your private key. Because your private key is the last 
tick on a mark when you want to transfer anything out, right? So, I mean, essentially everyone's going to say no. And I, I, I'm not in the wallet business, honestly. So, I, I, I <laughs> wouldn't you like to be one? <laughs> okay. Um, Basilio, also a student of Bachelor's of Business Administration. These are very good students. You see, I told you. All right. They are very interested in the topic. And he was saying, what are the advantages and disadvantages of using the blockchain? I think, Dr. Sai, I think you can definitely share your point for, for the ones that you've shared before. I'll, I'll jump in. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, uh, we, we have talked about all the, the, the 18 points, basically, on the advantages. But uh, just to put it in a nutshell, that blockchains offers uh, a platform to store, share, verify, and, uh, I mean, uh, basically, uh, yeah, share this information across multiple uh, platforms. And it is uh, very useful. I mean, of course, definitely the business sector has the, the big share of, of, of blockchain. It started there, actually, but definitely the education system, the, the research, and uh, especially nowadays with, with, with the COVID-19 situation, you know, the research and the race to, um, uh, to come up with a vaccine. You know, there are different, hundreds of different types of pharmaceutical companies are racing against time just to, 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 to see who's the first company that will actually manufacture a vaccine, a, world, uh, a worldwide vaccine. So in order for them to actually to, to, to do that, uh, it's a huge process that takes at least seven to 10 years, you know? But with the, with the utilization of this technology, it can de definitely be shortened to probably six months to one year. So yeah, the blo blockchain is, is the answer. It, it definitely provides uh, a very rich platform um, and uh, the, the chances for an error for it are very minimum. I, I wouldn't say like, um, zero uh but but i would say it's very minimum uh, error and uh yes it, it has a, a lot of advantages the disadvantages um well in terms of the education sector uh i'm not sure about the business part but i mean of course the business i think Josiela mentioned about the privacy issues and um you know like uh, maybe hackers can actually uh access using supercomputer it, it is possible. It's not something impossible. But in terms of the education uh, sector, uh, because it's a new technology now, so uh, usually a any form of new technology, um, um, it, it, it is costly uh, in the sense that uh, many people or many institutes are um, are not real are resisting actually to 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 go into it or to adapt it. Uh, but from, from my point of view, I, I, I don't see really such, uh, such major disadvantages in blockchain. In, in fact, it's the opposite. It has always uh, a great potential to, to save a, a lot of time and to make work uh, very seamless, actually. Yeah. Normally, I think, when I... Uh, yeah, please go ahead. I'm going to jump in here. And this is for the students. Definitely, this is for the students. Uh, being a consultant, I meet a lot of companies that do not have blockchain coders or blockchain tech people inside their company. So every time, you know, when a company wants to apply a blockchain system, they don't have an expert in-house to know about it. So if any of you are looking at this industry and thinking, is there a future in it? Yes, I do say there's a future in it. I'm not saying that you should go 110%, but always figure out a way how to you know, enhance your portfolio when you go out because there'll be millions of people who actually graduate out. But if you are able to tell the company, I know what this guy is talking about. I know he's not telling you the truth. I know that, you know, this is how the system is supposed to work and this is how you code it. Then you give value to the company that's actually going to look for you. And that is one of the disadvantages. You just don't have enough tech people um, in the industry at a higher level. And, and it's, it's complicated for consultants when we talk a certain language as well. All right. Uh, I was going to say that normally when I teach students, I always tell them, guys, my job here is to tell you what to say when somebody asks you a question. So humbly, I would like to say that the after listening to both of you, um, the advantages of blockchain is security. The disadvantages of blockchain is security. <laughs> both of them you know all right i i i really am so happy that today we uh
got this webinar on and I hope that it was very helpful for our students to learn, to understand, to um, you know, have a view about something that's really going to be the next big topic in the upcoming few years. Um, before we end, we would like to really thank you so much, Ms. Jazila, for your participation, Ms. Jazila Mohsen. And uh, we would like to um, maybe hear something as a conclusion from your good self. Sure. So I, I, I have noticed a lot of the questions are very crypto related, and I do understand there's so much interest in it, right? Um, that being said, you're actually going to have a session next week with Asia Blockchain Review. And the topic is very controversial a little bit. So if any of you want to join, you know, feel free. I'll probably send the link over to uh, Dr. Sa'an and Tara after this. So the topic that we're going to be discussing next week is are crypto assets, cryptocurrencies, Sharia compliant? So that is the question that we always have, right? Uh, because being a, in a Muslim country, uh, you do have Islamic finance. And the question that we get is how Sharia compliant is cryptocurrency? Um, so that is a topic that we're going to be discussing with one of um, the experts in the market in the field. And if you'd like to join, please feel free to join and ask all the questions because you'll be able to you know, review in more detail on what's happening in other um, Saudi countries and something like that. Yeah. Actually, uh, just to, to comment on that, I'm doing a USP presentation about why is it that you should study Islamic banking and finance. And the number one why is because it is now all over the world, whether you are an Islamic country or not, it doesn't matter. It is so popular now and 80% of the users of Islamic finance and banking are not Muslims. So I guess it's like also the next big, big thing. All right, Dr. Saad, we would also like to thank you so much for your contribution on the educational part of this. And Dr. Saad, uh, what would you like to say to our viewers at the end of this? Thank you so much. I just have one question, Tara. Is the e-certificates provider our blockchain verified? <laughs> We will talk about this later, Doctor. Okay. In the okay. future. When we have white hair, then we will make that. <laughs> okay, that's fair enough. Right, anyway, thank, thank you, you so much, guys, really. I really had a, a pleasure yes, talking to you. Blockchain so is the future. Just embrace it. Love Bye, guys. Just embrace it. Thank you so much, our viewers. Thank you for your questions, for your comments, for your support, for your highs and buys and laughs and jokes, and also for you interacting with each other. It was so fun. I hope that we will see you again on another webinar. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye -bye, guys. Thank you.